Good day. My name is Ikpamosa Ero and I am the United Nations Independent Expert on the Enjoyment of Human Rights by Persons with Albinism. It is a pleasure to be here invited to give a response in the category of underrepresented populations of people with disabilities in context of the Global Report on Disability. I congratulate all the organizations who have coordinated to produce this formidable report. In particular, I say thank you to the Disabilities Rights Monitor and to the University of Pretoria Center for Human Rights Disabilities Unit who have been instrumental in getting my mandate off the ground and serving people with albinism in Sub-Saharan Africa. I will be commenting on people with albinism as an underrepresented population. This generally means I'm speaking about people who are not institutionalized. You might ask yourself why and how are they underrepresented? First, as a minority within the disabilities movement, as a very misunderstood condition, not only in Africa, but in Asia and South America, essentially in every country where color matters, where there is a large contrast between the majority's appearance and the appearance of people with albinism. And this is where albinism also intersects color so that discrimination is being tackled on two fronts when it comes to this issue in terms of color and in terms of disability or in terms of racial discrimination as, and disability. We also have in albinism an ontological barrier which most disabilities face. But we find in albinism, it's essentially more deepened and heightened because of this intersectionality. The vision impairment in albinism is a ground for misunderstanding and misconception that have gone deeply into the roots of cultural institutions in most societies in developing countries. Also, and even more criti critical, is the issue of the perception of the coloring or appearance of the persons with albinism. And this has been the cornerstone of attacks and physical um, aggression towards persons with albinism in several countries, also trafficking, grave robberies. Finally, I also want to point out in terms of underrepresentation that there are also other harmful practices that people with albinism are subject to, including banishment based on their ap appearance. Ritual banishment has been reported in Africa and outside of Africa, particularly in South Asia. The ontological barrier in albinism is a challenge that we've been fighting with awareness raising, but has been proving very challenging. We are trying to counter culturally entrenched myths, especially those ones that characterize people with albinism outside of the realm of human beings. We've been trying to counter these with human rights perspectives the philosophy of the dignity of the human person. But this has been very challenging, has been very challenging, even though we have made some gains and some, some successes in the past few years. Now to go straight to the issue at hand, some of the problems that people with albinism have faced include the general issues highlighted in the report, such as poverty, such as exclusion from the decision-making table, lack of government response, lack of participation in affairs and decisions that affect them. However, to add to that, the particular issues people with albinism have faced, no surprisingly, goes to the heart of the intersectional experience that they encounter, including name calling. People with albinism have been called COVID-19 and coronavirus in several countries, again in Africa and in Asia in particular. This is unfortunately related to the misguided belief that the coronavirus is the disease of a white person. Consequently, because of the coloring of the people with person with albinism, there has been stigma and even um, banishment exacerbated by this pandemic. People with albinism, among the reports I have received, have been expelled from their villages and their community. They have also been expelled from sanitization stations areas where they should have prevention measures against this pandemic because there is the belief that they themselves are contaminants and contagion of this pandemic. 
There is also a lack of reasonable accommodation at sanitization stations when people with albinism are unable to use the alcohol provided due to a sensitive uh, skin. Some people with albinism have um, already extensive damage from the sun or precancerous lesions that put them um, at further risk when they use some of these uh, sanitization products. Lack of reasonable accommodation um, in several countries means that people with albinism do not always have access to the prevention measures that they should be getting. Also, we have had, unfortunately, cases of physical attacks, harmful practices increase. The records and research shows that when there is a time of conflict or crisis or poverty, belief in witchcraft increases. Unfortunately, these harmful practices related to witchcraft beliefs are some of the driving forces in the attacks against people with albinism, in the use and the sale of their body parts, including grave robberies. People with albinism also have chronic health issues, such as, as mentioned earlier, skin cancer. This requires access to sun protection um, creams and prevention measures such as sun protective clothing and also access to skin cancer treatment, both preventative and curative. All of these were compromised during the time of COVID-19. The poverty also sent people with albinism into the fields without these sun protection measures. Without those measures, people with albinism tend to die before the age of 40. An overwhelming majority, based on the research available, die by the age of 40. And this pandemic has exacerbate, exacerbated and possibly sped up the um, advancement of skin cancer on people with albinism. Several countries have and some are working on action plans to specifically target these underrepresented groups. But the pandemic has slowed down this process, has deprioritized the attention of these action plans, even though the budgets behind these plans are not so large that they would have compromised the pandemic response efforts. Finally, I wish to say the recommendations and the, um, and the, no, the, the recommendations noted in the report are some that I have also encountered in my um, engagement with persons with albinism. I support them. I also strongly support the recommendation that community level interventions be the target going forward. We have to help ourselves as people with disabilities through measures that not only address accommodation, but economic sustainability, economic independence, so that we build resiliences against any future pandemic. We also need to help ourselves in driving epistemic access to disabilities, to bring the information to the local level, to particular communities that are strategically um, more important in terms of each condition or disabilities as a group. This has been done right now. Um, for instance, in Tanzania, we have uh, good examples of this type of engagement where we have the mamas or the mothers of children with albinism engaging in long-term advocacy tied to entrepreneurship opportunities in this informal cooperative group that they have. They're able to make products and sell them like any other in the marketplace, give themselves a source of income while targeting midwives and hospital um, staff on albinism and trying to give those grassroots, um, give those people epistemic access to the meaning of albinism uh, so that people with albinism who are born from birth right away have the opportunity or have the right interventions to be able to be resilient in the face of um, lack of accommodation or at the other extreme like a pandemic such as this. I know the ultimate duty to protect and promote the right of the person with disability lies on the state. But we do have to be honest with ourselves and ask whether how we have been working with states is sustainable in light of the upheaval at the political international level and the narratives we're beginning to hear even about people with disabilities. Indeed, the best interest of the child and human dignity calls for other ways while we seek the support of government. I thank you for listening.